Um, I know uh, being uh, outside of Detroit, you are considered, you know, from Detroit. Is that actually, were you uh, born and raised uh, Ann Arbor, or what's the, where are you, uh, where'd you grow up at, actually? Well, I, <clears throat> I was born in Rochester, Michigan, but kind of uh, uh, spent most of my childhood actually in uh, Florida. And then we moved to uh, um, the metro Detroit area, but I never lived in Detroit. People just identify me as a Detroit artist. Mm -hmm. And did you, um, I mean, w is that, is that kind of something that you've embraced, or is, it, is there some validity to the concept of a Detroit sound? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, because, uh, you know, if, if you're in, around the suburbs or whatever, you're still being influenced by the sound that, that, that's uh, coming from the city and, uh, um, you know, identify with a lot of Detroit sounds and stuff like that. But generally, that's how the people labeling me as a Detroit artist. If someone asks me personally, like, you know, where are you from or... I say I'm from Ann Arbor, you know, even though actually I live in Ypsilanti, but, <laughs> but, uh, I how far, I mean, for those of us who aren't clear on it, how far away are those places from actually downtown, well, uh, gritty Detroit? Yeah, that's, uh, Ann Arbor's about 40 minutes by car, um, you know, it's the University of Michigan, um, a nice college town, pretty mellow. How old were you when you, uh, first started making your own music? Uh, well, I, when I was making my own music, I was in bands um, in middle school and high school. So, your traditional band lineup, guitar, bass, drums, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Just, we were playing punk and indie rock, and, and uh, I was into, like, uh, shoegazing stuff, and from that to, like, can, and, yeah, metal. So, every, every band, um, when they start out, it seems like plays cover versions. Uh, what what were your specialties, you guys? Well, I mean, I was doing a lot of the writing, and uh, so you didn't like the cover versions. You no, no, no. I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't trying to do that. Actually, we we did do that for uh, um, for Battle of the Bands in high school or something like that, and it was terrible. I really hated it. We did uh, what is it? Uh, Confusion is Sex by Sonic Youth and Ooh. stuff like that. So, wow. Deep. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and I mean, I like that song and everything like that, but I. You know, I didn't want to be writing other people, people's music, so or yeah. playing other people's music. So, when when were you? Do you remember first being aware of some of the other uh, sounds coming out of Detroit? What was the stuff that you know, looking back on it, might be considered typical Detroit stuff? That uh, uh, when did you first start hearing that? Uh, well, I mean. What happened was I was DJ, or I wasn't DJing rather, I was skateboarding a lot and, um, you know, a lot of my friends who were skaters um, kind of turned me on to a lot of different kinds of music. And I don't know about all over the area, but um, in uh, the Metro Detroit area, skaters were listening to anything from like um, metal to, to hip hop. And that was like, that was like in the mid 90s. So a lot of people were going to Packard plant parties in Detroit and raves and stuff like that. And, it, that that uh, that experience turned me on to things like um, Richie Haunton from Windsor and and uh, Jeff Mills and Robert Hood, and uh, I was really influenced by that sound and the the sound that I heard at the raves. So there was a decent rave culture uh, in the Detroit area. Yeah. When you say the Packard plant. Mm -hmm. Is that the actual auto plant where the yeah. cars were made? Yeah, that's one of the old auto plants. Yeah, for for anyone who doesn't know uh, Detroit, uh, also known as the Motor City, Motown, um, is the was once the car capital of the world, and uh, now I guess there's a lot of remnants of that uh, industry, and yeah. so uh, that's pretty that's pretty ill that they had raves in the old. Uh, Car factory. So, what was what was uh, what kind of stuff was getting played at those parties? Who was DJing, or was it not about the DJ? <clears throat> well, I mean, I don't know what other people thought, really. Uh, I mean, um, like I said, Jeff Mills and Robert Hood were DJing there a lot, and Claude Young and Daniel Bell. Um, uh, you know, all kinds of people, and um, but the sound the sound at that time was like 
kind of what was getting real big at that time was called minimal techno, and it's very different from what people call minimal techno nowadays. A lot of a lot of the popular minimal techno right now tends to be, you know, like European or German stuff, and they're using like small sounds, and it's not necessarily any more minimal in in its concept than. Um, most techno or anything like that, but what was being called um, minimal back then was was things like um, Robert Hood, like artists like Robert Hood and DBX, and that was at that time very different because I think we were coming out of a sound of like pretty hardcore rave sound, you know, and uh, um, hand raising tracks and stuff like this. And then at that time, then I think people got burnt out on it, and then uh, so we were hearing a lot of minimal stuff. What uh, what would kind of characterize that sound? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that. Well, pretty much, you know, not a whole lot of layered sounds, you know what I mean? Um, not a lot of very big changes in the music. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, like, for example, Robert Hood was doing a lot of this thing where um, this uh, interesting sequencing with a synthesizer where... Um, uh, a track would actually, or, or like a synth line would phase in time. It, it'd be like seven steps instead of the typical uh, eight steps or, and stuff like that, and just weird like arpeggiations and and. Um, so you'd have like a seven beat rhythm overlaid over over a four four kick over basically a four, four, and so stuff it's like, like that. Shifting yeah. off. Yeah, exactly. Gradually. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, and like just like a like a one one sine wave or something like that, just making a sound. Like if you think about songs like Freak and. Uh, um, what's another one? Uh, one of, one of DBX's big, big tracks. Lo yeah, yeah, Losing Control and stuff like that. And, and uh, yeah, th those are pretty typical. What kind of stuff uh, were people using to make that? Uh, what, what kind of gear were they using? Well, I think, I think the analog stuff was still pretty normal, but I mean, you can tell like DBX was using things like Casio RZ1 drum machines and, and, uh, and 909s and stuff like that. Were you uh, still playing in bands at that point when you were going to raves? No, that's that's actually uh, when I um, started going to raves and stuff, and I was hanging out with these skaters. Like one of them um, introduced me to uh, Aphex Twin, and then I was like, oh, okay, th so this is this is something I can do on my own, and and uh, there are like other sounds involved, and. Um, I can explore more and experiment more with this kind of music. So then I started just working alone and and uh, actually I started DJing around that time, around like '95. Yeah. What did you uh, What did you start making your music on at that point? What were you using? Well, me and my friend Josh, we were just using like toy keyboards and and uh, uh, running toy keyboards through guitar pedals and then mic uh, and then into an amplifier and miking the amp and and uh, just really. We really didn't know what we were doing. We weren't do using any MIDI or anything like that. But um, then eventually, uh, in high school, I met this uh, this guy named Roger, and we became really big friends. And he uh, started. Um, he was using Ultra Tracker and Fast Tracker at the time, and um, and then he discovered uh, um, AST, and um, we started using that. He pretty much taught me how to use uh, tr Tracker software. Mm -hmm. And did you did you set out to try and emulate and copy the the things that you were hearing, or did you consciously try sort of with the punk ethos or whatever break away and make something experimental and new? Well, basically, a little bit of both, to be honest with you. There were a lot of things that I liked in the music that I was buying and and uh, hunting, but um, I would uh, go to sleep at night and you know, have a dream that I found a record or something like that. And I was like, in my dream, I'd be playing the record. And I'm like, oh, man, this is the best the best thing ever. And, and uh, you know, and then I'd wake up and be really pissed off, you know, like, damn, I don't, I, don't, oh, I thought I found some really great records and <laughs> I don't have them anymore, what happened? So then I was basically, you know, wanted to make music like that basically because I was really inspired and um, I wanted to fill that gap, you know, the, the, the sounds that, that I was dreaming about. And, you know, I, I liked uh, people like uh, Square Pusher and Dextr uh, DJ Dextrous and, and uh, um, you know, Aphex Twin and stuff like that, but I wanted to do something like what they were doing, but a little bit different. And uh, did you, were there other people who you could kind of 
bounce ideas off of, or was this really a, a sort of retreat to, to my studio and be by myself and kind of mad scientist uh, type of thing going on? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of the, I didn't know a whole lot of people that were into what I was into until a little bit later when I met Todd Osborne in Ann Arbor. Um, and then he was like, him and Roger were the, were the only two people that I was really like, I really like cared about what they thought. You know, basically I was just doing it to make me happy. I didn't even actually think about what other people liked, you know, or, or what they knew about or anything like that. And then when I started going down to Ann Arbor, um, I was making trips out there to go record shopping. And um, Todd had this uh, record store called uh, Play Pressure. And um, he had collected a whole bunch of, um, oh, he anyway, he just had a whole bunch of really good raga jungle there and, and hip hop and, you know, other stuff. And, and uh, it was, the quality control was pretty great. And I was just like, okay, you know, I, I think I would ask him questions all the time and, and bug him. And, and uh, I think I, I sent, I gave you a cassette tape or something like that. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Todd told me uh, he first noticed you because you used to come into the store and ask about the most obscure one-off records that that no one had ever heard of and uh, and eventually uh, you told him that you were making your own music etc and and it was basically on after that yeah I mean I remember I remember going to uh, parties in Detroit and there's this DJ named rotator who was playing just a He's the, just the dopest jungle DJ I've ever seen. I mean, it was just, he, w he, w he was mixing jungle like someone might, um, someone like a ghetto tech or booty DJ would mix, like a Detroit ghetto tech DJ would mix, like really fast, doing lots of cuts in and out of tracks in, in like a minute. And, uh, and he was just playing this stuff that was just so obscure. And sometimes he would, he would spin uh, like a square pusher track and I'd recognize it. But then he'd go into some like just uh, crazy uh, mashed up like dark step track or or uh, um, you know raga jungle track that I I could tell was like from from uh, the early '90s, but I wasn't sure what it was. And so he was really inspiring and and uh, let me know that there was like more stuff out there to look for. So at at this point, are you thinking of yourself as I'm a DJ and I want to collect these records to go out and and play and maybe like recreate these raves or, or, or parties that you liked? Or are you thinking like, I want to make this music and make a, m you know, become a recording artist or something like that? W where's your head at at that point? Yeah, I mean, at that point I knew I just, I knew I was making music. I was pretty confident or just happy with what I was getting done. And uh, I had been DJing at that point already. I was, I was DJing in like coffee houses around the area and some parties and, and uh, gallery spaces in, in Detroit and stuff. So at that point I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a name or anything like that, but I was getting a lot of experience doing it. And, and, uh, um, and that's, that's just kind of what I was doing. I wasn't really like thinking about where I was going to end up. It was just making me happy at the time. So I just did it. And uh, so how did you make that transition from sort of bedroom production to someone's going to put my, my music out? Well, um, I, I didn't really have to do much. I was working at, uh, at that time I got hired by Todd to play at, uh, or to um, work at Dub Plate Pressure. And um, uh, this guy named Sam Valenti comes into the store and says, hey, I heard you make house music. And, and I was like, yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of house tracks, but I've been making all kinds of stuff. I mean, when I, as soon as I got AST, I was making um, everything I wanted because I was really like into Pete Rock and Premiere and, and um, you know, um, there's this uh, DJ PNS from the Mole Men in Chicago had some Fresh pro Produce mixtapes. One was called, well, they were all, all called Fresh Produce. I think this was volume four. It was an instrumental cassette. And it, man, the, this, the sound was super dusted and there was wow and flutter in the, in the cassette and it was super hissy, but it was just uh, really simple, really mellow hip hop beats and stuff, and I was just listening to this all the time. And so I was making hip hop and um, you know jungle and, and techno and, and house and 
what people call IDM or brain dance and um, electro and anyway so I had it all on a cassette tape and I was playing this music in my car just to kind of like reflect and, and see if I wanted to make any changes and um, when so when, anyway when Sam came into the store and asked me if I had anything I just went to my car and got the, gave him the cassette and I said there's other stuff on there but I think the the house tracks are the first two or the first three or something and so he, I guess, listened to the whole thing and came back with, with some big ideas. So, yeah. And did he, did he then? Uh, well the first releases kind of contained a little bit of everything, or uh, what? What was that? What was on? I mean, what ended up? He comes into you thinking house music. What ended up as the final product? Well, actually, he, no, he didn't sign any of the house music. That, that was the funny thing is, uh, you know, you mean what was the final product like, yeah, like he the final releases? You didn't, you didn't end up being a house. He didn't end up releasing the, the house stuff after all, right? No, no. I mean, I, I, I want to add right now that already Todd and I had released um, a couple of Rewind records and stuff. We had our own jungle label we started, and um, Todd was doing most of the work, so I don't want to take full credit for it, but... Um, we we both had uh, we were both working on one track, or he would do one track and I would do the other, and and um, so the creative input was equal there, and we had already had sort of a really weird like cult following following. Like there was a few people in Toronto who knew what we were doing. There was people here and there that were aware of what we were doing, but I we weren't really like people didn't know about what we were doing. It was just super underground, very limited and low budget, and but um. Yeah, so any, anyway, back to what you were saying. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he was pretty much interested in, in maybe, what was it? It was like three kinds of music and, and uh, that I did. And so then I had to think about, like, what I wanted to do about that, like how I wanted to kind of package everything or categorize it for people. So I create, um, created uh, a few aliases. Um, Dabri, which is which is the hip hop, um, James T. Cotton, also JTC now, um, uh, for all the the techno and um, house music, and um, the music under my own name is just IDM or Brain Dance, and uh, and I also um, had another project that I was keeping secret for a long time called Charles Manier, which is like EBM, sort of influenced by like early uh, Severed Heads, CHBB, Les Antangereaux, and, um, and stuff like this. So. Why, do you, um, why do you think it's important to uh, keep these different aliases and uh, categorize things like that? Basically, people, you know, I want to know what I'm buying, you know, basically. I mean, in the end, it's my music, and... Uh, you know, I like it, but when it comes to other people, I like to respect the diversity and in, in what people like to specialize in and what they're collecting and stuff. So basically, and also it's good for presentation, I think. Like, if, if you kind of, um, uh, creating aliases is sort of a way for me to categorize it myself and create like an own, you know, like uh, Dabri has his own world, you know what I mean? And, and like, I would fetishize about bands and records, like when I was going through my mom's um, record collection, I remember just like listening to a Talking Heads album and like just staring at the artwork and just kind of like um, getting absorbed in that world, you know. And that's what it sort of is as an artist. You're creating um, a space for you and maybe other people to um, retreat to and, and escape to. And uh, so that's so so by um, you know by creating these different aliases and stuff like that and and not making like one album a hodgepodge of all these sounds I can really really like dig deep and, and specialize in something and, and uh, you know and I like to do it with some sort of um, um, I don't know how to, how to say this um, I didn't really want people to think about the fact that all these different aliases were coming from the same person you know what I mean I kind of wanted people to be like I wanted to be comp competent basically and not you know be uh sound like someone who was, um, you know, you could tell like they were, they were typically uh, doing drum and bass, but then they had a, like a side project that was trip hop and it wasn't, 
wasn't fully like good or you know what I mean right. like yeah, I, don't, that, I don't know how to describe that but it's the danger you you uh, you don't want to be sort of dabbling in a little bit of this and a little bit of that yeah. uh, coming off as as a, f a full-fledged artist in in each uh, style that that you approach mm -hmm. but I guess the danger you know you feel like um, well I put all this work into becoming you know getting Dabry known or James T. Cotton known and now I have to go out and let people know who Tad Mullenix is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, that's okay though because I kind of feel like people, only, it's going to be like a small percentage of people that really, really dig deep and give a crap, you know, that are um, going to gonna be sort of um, um, affected by knowing that all the aliases come from one person and you know, I think that can be a good and bad thing, but, um, you know, I think the variety of people are into niches, you know what I mean? And, and I, I don't know too many um, junglists that are really into EBM, you know what I mean? And I respect that, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's bad for, for someone to be um, not into another kind of music, you know what I mean? And, and uh, I know it sounds kind of political, but... Um, Presentation is very important in the art world, and, and uh, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And I guess you run into, you must run into people at, at gigs and stuff who, uh, who know Dabry but have no idea of the rest of your stuff or who know y your work in, in one particular field. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and uh, I mean, is that something that you, do you encourage uh, people to, Will you let people know, you know, that that's you do all this other stuff, or is it more uh, they have to figure it out for themselves if they're really interested? Yeah, they, if they're really in it, you know, I don't want to. I'm not like a salesman. I'm not like, you know what I mean. I don't want to be like, yeah, you know, if you like this, you should also check out blah blah blah, and you know, um, and uh, usually people don't care. You know what I mean? They're like, you know, uh, you know, if I were to. I can imagine if I were to, yeah, I also do this hip-hop stuff, they'd be like, yeah, 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 like, <laughs> we're at a loud club or something like that, and, you know, it's, I'm not trying to have a lengthy conversation with them, and, and pretty much they just wanted to tell me that they like what they saw, you know, but sometimes, yeah, someone will come up to me and be like, uh, yeah, I really like what you do, and I have to be like, well, which, what, what thing are you talking about, you know what I mean, and I don't know, yeah, so. <laughs> so, uh, just to um, backtrack a little bit, what, have, has your gear from from when you started making these cassette tapes has it changed? Uh, of course, it's you've added stuff, but can you take us through um, what you were working on at that time after the toy keyboard stage mm -hmm. um, up until uh, uh, presently? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, after the toy, I, again, the toy keyboard stage was very experimental, and none of that stuff has been released in. And uh, I don't know, if it, I like some of it, but I don't know if other people get it because I think I, I'm attached to it in a, in a nostalgia way. But, um, um, uh, yeah, like, uh, like I said, Roger introduced me to AST and Todd and I and him were, were all using that stuff. Um, what, what's uh, AST? AST? Is, AST, I'm sorry, AST is sort of like Fast Tracker and Ultra Tracker. It's an EMU-endorsed um, shareware program that runs in DOS. Um, and it's very, very, uh, it's it's very uh, graphically primitive, and uh, uh, a lot of people, if you don't have any experience with a tracker, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense because of things like, um, uh, because of the shortcuts you're using, because of the, um, uh, you know, there's like a, a, it's sort of like a player piano. It scrolls, and there's a, sort of like a step ladder image going like this, and and you basically you're placing the note. You're giving an effect um, to it, like uh, symbolized by a letter, and then um, and then you're um, tell giving it the parameters with two digits, but with hex enumeration. So like the values go through from one to nine, and then after nine A B C D E F. So then you have like values like one A one B and and on and on. So. Um, I don't know if that makes us any sense to anybody, but in, instead of values of 10, you're dealing with values of 16. So you have to do some extra math, and um, they, they they just do it that way so they have more. Um, uh, how do you describe that? Like, uh, so you have um, 
you can have uh, more value in one uh, digit um, space. So you can actually uh, do a little bit more that way. Um, should, they should have just went to Z instead of F. I don't know why they stopped at F, but. Um, yeah, yeah, so I mean, it, it's, but anyway, when you get a hang of it, and it's not the best sounding program, but it, but it, but it did the trick, and we use a lot of mono samples and stuff like that, and, but you just have to kind of like be a ninja and, and, and uh, make do with what, you, what you're using, and that's pretty much key. I mean, when people, I'm not a gearhead, you know what I mean, and, and, uh, and I learned from using AST that um, it doesn't matter what you're using. I mean, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's what, you, what you do with what you've got. And, uh, well, that, that's sort of an interesting uh, point you're making because mm -hmm. particularly with uh, Detroit, I think maybe more than many other places, the sound is identified with particular pieces of gear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that goes with everything, though, I think. You think it's particularly yeah, uh, Detroit? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I, I hear Detroit, I think, 909. Really? Okay. You know, and, and, and stuff like that. I mean, mm -hmm. and Chicago as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. You think of, like, acid squelchy stuff mm -hmm. that is, whether it's made on those machines or not, mm -hmm. it's made to emulate that sound. I mean, I wonder how much, uh, how much of what you've done or is is a result partially of of the programs you've been you started using mm -hmm. did you fall into that mindset of kind of like these are the limitations of this program that I'm using just by chance when I started out mm -hmm. now I want to go back with something new but I want to make something that I'm used to making stuff that sounds like that and oh, oh yeah yeah uh, is that is that a valid uh yeah, I mean that's your opinion, dude. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just wondering. I, I don't know. I'm not. I, I, well, I, I mean, I, I know what you're saying because well, I think what it is is that, you know, you're talking about when you're talking about Chicago house and Detroit techno, you're talking about like the beginnings of a certain style of music. You know what I mean? And that will, with that, everybody will sort of fetishize about what was the gear that was out back then and what were they using. And I think, yeah, I mean, like you have that. Uh, that's the context of the music, and those are the those are the people that you know, like Larry Heard or something like that, and uh, you know, um, you know, uh, Marshall Jefferson and these guys, and, and and Derek May. They were using other pieces of gear, but the big, you know, the big, uh, you know, um, the big tracks and, and the most influential tracks are, um, you know, things that get uh, people get really obsessed about and want to emulate. And uh, I do a little bit of that, and. Um, but I think that's I like I like presets I like you know what I mean I like stuff like that I'm not oh, I'm not a purist that I'm like every time I'm making something it's got to be some new crazy sound you know what I mean it's um, sometimes you're looking for that cheap pre-made you know um, um, sort of naive sound. So when you're using that that program, you are sampling stuff as well as. Uh, Generating? Did it have like a tone generator? No, it's a like? it's a full on. It's just a sampler. Oh, okay. Pretty, yeah, it's so a sampler sequencer. Sorry. So it was all it was all sampled stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's you're sequencing waves with AST basically. And so how did you how did you progress from that? I mean, did you feel mm -hmm. like happy with that? You know, that was handling everything you wanted to do, or did it? Did you reach a point where you felt like you know what I want to? I want to go beyond what, what this program is letting me do. Yeah, I, well, basically, when you're sequencing waves, there's not much tweaking going on. You know, there are some envelopes, and you can just change the resonance on things and, and, and stuff like that. But, it, it, I, you know, I found myself sometimes sampling th a 303 from another track, and I was just like, oh, man, this sucks. I just want, a, I just want a 303, man. <laughs> and, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, so eventually I started buying gear and drum machines. And, and also... You know, for me personally, I I, uh, I get really worn out making music on a computer after a while. The, I really want to um, actually be engaged um, with a with a piece of equipment that's sort of interactive. Even MIDI controllers kind of bother me because they're very um, I, uh, I don't know. They have they have don't have character or, the, or w what this button does can change for every uh, different program you're using and stuff like that. I like I like these old machines because they have a lot of character and um, they're kind of difficult to use, which which is a good challenge. Uh, good challenge and um, and also those challenges sort of um, um, 
keep you keep you kind of restricted too. You know what I mean? I think a, a lot of things is people, um, especially nowadays where where software is very widely available and it's a global culture and all this stuff that, you know, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like New York, man. It's like you go to New York and it's like. Um, I'm 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 never super impressed because like I w am I go there and I'm like everybody they have everything here you know what I mean they could do whatever they want they could be inspired by anything but um, not to diss New York but all I'm saying is that um, I'm not impressed by the things that come out of there because considering like how what what's at their fingertips you know what I'm saying and that's kind of what it is with like. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of artists, you know, you can you can get a laptop and and make whatever you want and use use whatever you want, you know. And uh, people are using pirated software all the time, and and um, it's kind of like they don't have enough limitations, and uh, they're not they're not really get uh, focused enough. You know? Yeah, uh, it's it's definitely true that limitations can uh, force you to be creative, and uh, no limitations almost can have the opposite effect uh, on things. So where did you go uh, gear-wise from there? Well, I can't. Um, I mean, are you, what's your, is your. Is ev your eventually. Like yeah, is your current setup uh, vintage stuff? Yeah, I do have a lot of vintage stuff. I, I basically, Todd and I, um, put a studio together of um, a 909, 707, 505, 303, 101, all the Roland stuff, um, a lot of their early Roland stuff, and uh, um, vintage drum machines, RZ1, um, and, and, and uh, yeah, basic stuff like that. So uh, I want to know how did uh, Dabry become uh, Daubry? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Well, um, Basically, uh, it, it was when, when I worked with JD for the first time. Um, when, I th when did you uh, become aware of uh, JD and his music? Uh, I think, you know, I think it was basically S Slum Village was kind of, um, was pretty hot at that time. How popular were they in Detroit? Because they were, they were an underground thing that mm -hmm. sort of like, that people in the know knew about, but they definitely didn't have the kind of exposure, uh, you know, that they've gotten subsequently. Yeah, I think I think if you were ahead in, in Detroit, you knew about them, basically. I mean, no matter what kind of music you were into, if you were sort of around, and like I said, I was hanging out with a lot of skaters and stuff, and I think at that time, skaters were pretty pretty hip when it came to music and stuff. And, and um you know, I was hanging out with Todd. Todd might actually introduce me to Slum Village, and uh, you know, hanging out at a lot of record stores. Basically, I mean, I was a DJ, so I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I don't know how many people really knew about them, but I know that they had a pretty big underground following in Detroit. So, and uh, what was I talking about, JD? With the yeah. Oh, Dabry. Um, well, I think like you know, we talked to him, and I was saying Dabry, and Sam was saying Dabry about you know, he was like, yeah, okay, I'm hip, like. Yeah, I I actually have his uh, I actually bought his records. Um, House shoes sold Jay my records at uh, record time, I believe, in Roseville. And uh, I don't think anybody really knows how to pronounce the name just because of the way it's written out. And that's I I didn't care about how it was pronounced. I liked uh, about how the letters looked when they were together. You know, s sort of from like a um, graffiti um, standpoint, just. And um, so I was just calling it Dabry, and then um, and then I got signed to um, when I got when I got uh, when I put out a record on Eastern Development, Scott Heron's record label. Um, they they wrote out a bio, and they were the first people to try to phonetically, you know, describe the word, and they got it wrong. <laughs> they, they wrote they wrote Dabry, and I think it's still on the page like Dabry or whatever. Not wrong, but just not how I said it. Which I guess is technically wrong. So, um, you know, and then uh, I think like you know, even though we talked to Jay, I, I can still imagine him going like, "What did? He, how did he pronounce the name and stuff?" So as, then I imagine, you know what, when he rapped on 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 Game Over and said Dabri like and rhymed it with Hobby, you know, and this is Jay. For me, it's like I'm not gonna correct him, <laughs> dude. Like this is, this is in a way he defined what I was into, so I didn't mind him. Uh, 
you know, change in my name and, and the way he used it and the rhyme was really good and, and uh, um, so, so it was sort of an honor. <laughs> did, you, uh, did, you per did you choose that track to, to go to him or, or was that uh, something that he listened to and, and chose or how did, that, how did the track and him uh, hook up? Well, the way it worked was we, we had a friend who was, um, Sam and I had a friend who was uh, working for a, a car magazine, basically. And the car magazine said, hey, like, Riley, will you go and interview um, Dilla while he's driving one of these new, um, I think it was a Mercedes SUV or something like that. So when Riley was interviewing Jay, um, Jay said something like, uh, I'm working on a new album and... Um, you know, other people are doing the beats and stuff like that. And, uh, okay, I think uh, Riley told us about that. And I was like, oh, okay, so we got a hold of him. And uh, I was like, if you need some beats for your album, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I've got some. And so we gave him a CD of, like, four beats on it. And um, we met up at his studio, and he was saying, well, you know... Um, you know, I don't, I don't know where the album is going to be at because it was this album for a big label and, and uh, you know, I think I'm all set for now and he didn't want to hold anything up and he said, well, well why, don't, why don't I uh, do something for your album? And I said, okay. And he, he really liked um, game, the beat for Game Over and he also liked um, this one with the, with the, with the um, uh, a Lou Rawls sample in it called um, It's Strange. And um, later on, he used this beat for a, a little interlude on Donuts. Um, it wasn't my beat. I think he, like, resampled it and did something a, something a little bit different with it. But I, you know, I thought that was pretty fresh. Took it as a compliment that he used it. And I never used anything with it because I was afraid about sample clearing and, and you know, all that. Or I wasn't, but the label was, pretty much. And... Um, so yeah, he picked Game Over and Fat Cat and um, um, Dank from Frank and Dank was in there and, and uh, Young RJ from BR Gunna was in there and House Shoes, we were all in the studio and um, you know, they were playing, Jay was like, I like this beat and they were playing it and Fat Cat started, started uh, freestyling uh, about guns and stuff and, and uh, I was like, yeah, man, this is, <laughs> this is pretty fresh because at that time I was getting really sick of conscious rap and, and um, it's just the aesthetic that came with like the super bohemian um, uh, syllable hog style and this, this was a while back. Uh, things have changed now. And, and, um, but back then it was kind of like, all right, I don't want to, you know, uh, I don't want to be identified as like a backpack and like indie hip hop like kid. Plus I was living in Ann Arbor and, you know, um, atmosphere was coming into town like every other, every other um, month. And, and the, the sound was just, um, all the people inspired by that sound was just um, getting on my nerves. And, and I just didn't like, I didn't want to be associated with that. And especially... At that time, people were calling my sound glitch hop and stuff, and this was not my <laughs> invention. And and uh, generally, when I think about glitch hop, a lot of other groups come to mind that I really don't like. And uh, and and I I thought always I was making hip hop with just like my own flair to it, or with like sort of a very synthetic sound or, or something like that. But then when this cor corny term called glitch hop came out, I was just like, man, this is. This is like sucking the sex out of the music complete, completely, you know, or it's just like not, I, I, I just, it sounds so academic and, and didn't have uh, the sort of feeling um, that, I, that I wanted in my music and stuff. So, so anyway, I was really excited to work with MCs that were, that sort of had a street delivery and, um, and, and that I liked in, anyway. I, that's just H the kind of hip hop I like. Did you work with MCs before? Before no, that? that was the that was the first track, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and did you ha did you ever have any uh, um, sort of uh, producer type of input into their lyrics or or the way that the the song the lyrics were arranged on the song or anything like that? Nothing like that. I just chose MCs that I really really liked. Everybody on my album I already liked a whole lot, and I was a big fan of what they did. I didn't settle and didn't you know I didn't want to. Um, I wanted I like I chose them because I like what they do and 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 you just sort of they they add the tracks and you let them go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Uh, and so what did you what did you use to make uh, game over? 
<laughs> I use Fruity Loops to make Game Over, yeah. Yeah, that, that was like, uh, I'm, I've only made like four tracks on Fruity Loops and they were all Dabry tracks and, and um, that, those are the only, that's the only time I've used another program. Nice. Uh, let's let's uh, check this out for a minute. Uh, see if we can get this going. Uh. That's that hot ish. <laughs> yeah, this is like after we went in the studio. This was well after Welcome to Detroit came out, and then when we went in the studio, he gave me a CD of Rough Draft well before that was out, and I think it was really good because um, we were on. I felt we were like we were on the same page basically because. When I went to the studio and I said I wasn't into the backpacking stuff and I really like street delivery, I, he was definitely feeling that. He was like, all right, yeah, yeah. So, um, and you can hear a lot of that in Rough Draft, too. And I think uh, we were just on the same page in terms of like do, doing something a little different at that time. So it turned out good that way. And uh, did you ever, did you have, uh, that was obviously a big record. Uh, I mean, uh, in our <laughs> in our world, um, did you have pressure from the label to kind of come with more stuff like that, or or stuff like what? Like game over. In terms of like it, in what way? Uh, street MCs, street MCs? On, no. on beats that were of the tempo and vibe that could be played on like hip hop mix shows or something like that. Not at all. That was something I've been wanting to do and I was, um, like I said before, that's just the kind of hip hop that I listen to. Um, um, uh, and uh, yeah, the, the uh, label didn't give me any pressure from, for any direction, for going in any direction or anything like that. So, um, but beyond the, the hip hop stuff, at this time you're still making you're still releasing stuff uh, under uh, uh, completely different genres. Mm -hmm. uh, when you when you're out there DJing, do you DJ as Dabri or do you DJ as James C. Cotton or? Uh, if I DJ, it's uh, either as SK One doing the jungle or JTC or James D. Cotton doing techno and dance music in general. Do we have uh, any of your techno stuff? On, on uh, no, I brought some though. Okay, can we can we hear that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so this is actually a remix of uh, a group called Orgy Electronique, um, EP called The Garden, and um, yeah. very influenced by the music box and uh, Ron Hardy. Yeah. Sorry, it's a long one. Yeah. It's a, that's the idea though, it's a beat track, so you know, that's just the, uh, the tradition I think with these beat tracks is, you know, th this kind of groove and, and there's a disco element to that long, um, that long sort of track and, and uh, that was that was a really fun remix. Definitely. So you mentioned being inspired by the music box, uh, Ron Hardy. Can you uh, can you let the people know you know what what the music box was or what that means to you or y yeah. and to, to the city? Yeah, I mean, okay. So I'm maybe fourth generation, so I don't know like if I'm getting all the stories right. But the uh, the deal is is um, you know. Uh, Basically, the house, uh, the disco and house scene in Chicago was, um, um, uh, you know, a warehouse party sort of environment. And there was uh, Frankie Knuckles doing, um, um, doing some uh, DJing. And, and then there was Ron Hardy. And a lot of people um, thought Ron Hardy was more experimental and a little more aggressive with his stuff. And uh, he was doing a lot of edits and drum machine workouts and, and stuff like this. And um, he would play, Ron Hardy would play demos that, that friends would bring into the club and, and, and he would actually play the tape there on the spot. Uh, he'd preview it first and, and if you'd like it. You couldn't really do this at, at a Frankie Knuckles party. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, basically uh, I collected tapes, or not tapes, but recordings of tapes and and uh, stuff like this, and just got really way into what Ron Hardy was doing, and I always thought that um, what he did was was very experimental in terms of 
the kind of stuff he would spin and how he would spin it, and it's a lot more my style, and it's a lot, a lot dirtier and um, more experimental, basically. So that was that was a remix, you said. Mm -hmm. How much of the original track is in there? What what elements? Well, I just I can play it really quick, like a snippet, and this is the original elements are sort of there melodically in that bass line that was, but. Um, your track is a lot uh, harder. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's that was just sort of a, a whole reimagining of of that concept, I guess. I mean, there wasn't really any. You didn't use any sounds or anything like that from from the uh, original track, did you? No, they didn't give me any any source material. So I basically uh, tried to. Just reflect on the melodies in the in the in the strings and the bass line, but and really the beat that I in my track in my remix was sort of a remake of something I heard Ron Hardy play um, and uh, um, in one of his mixes where it's just this very long uh, that that drum machine uh, sequence going on for a while. There's little bits of soul or something just buried, very. Uh, Buried in the sound, very quiet, and a little disco guitar and stuff like that. And he did really cool stuff like that. Do you do uh, a lot of remix work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how how often are you actually kind of creating a new track as opposed to using elements of, of what's in the original? Are you usually doing something like that where it's a complete sort of clean slate start over? Uh, no, I do a little bit of both, but I mean, I, I often, I'm often doing that, where it's just, I have to remake it because some of the people that I'm remixing um, are doing it all on like two track or something, and, and there's no way for me to just kind of like grab little snippets unless there's a synth solo on there or, or a drum solo or something. Anyway, I have all this gear anyway, so I might as well just try to cover it or do a remake or something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so what... Uh, where are you uh, going now? I mean, what's are you uh, have? Do you have uh, new projects or kind of a new any new aliases coming up? Or are you pretty happy with uh, what the kind of separate uh, channels that you've been working in so far? I'm happy with the separate channels I'm working in so far. I'm because I've got. Uh, four aliases going on at once and a lot of collaborating projects, it keeps me busy. So there's really not much room for anything else and unless I, you know, totally like quit, drop everything I'm doing and start something new. So uh, are you, do you tour uh, extensively or how often are you at home? I, I try not to tour very much. I just don't, I don't really uh, enjoy touring over long periods of time. I like to tour like like a month at a time, and, and I prefer to be DJing when I'm doing that. I noticed uh, the other night when you were playing, uh, it seemed like you were playing all vinyl. Is that, was that the case? No, I, I played a few CDs. I've got, I brought some unreleased stuff, and, and I, I spun uh, some of that. And, um, but yeah, I, I do collect vinyl, and I'm still a vinyl DJ. Even uh, touring overseas and stuff like that, you're bringing your box with you? Yeah, it's becoming sort of... Uh, uh, an anachronism for a lot of DJs. Uh, you don't see them out there with vinyl anymore. Um, is that is that something you know important to you? Keeping the vinyl culture. Do you feel that vinyl has a sound or anything like that, or is it just something you're more comfortable with? I mean, I have all this vinyl, and I've been collecting for a long time, so I might as well use it. You know, I I do run the risk of like losing some of it. And um, you know, or something getting ruined or lost in custo or uh, lost in the transit. But um, I I like vinyl. I think it's a very um, fun format. I like uh, I like having large artwork and all those kind of things. So, um, but I'm not a purist, and I don't frown on things like Serato or stuff like that. Is is there a lot of uh, improvisation when you're DJing, uh, as far as like wh when you do mix it, or when you blend songs together, or what you're going to play, what order you're going to play in? Yeah, yeah, I improvise everything. Um, and and it changes based on what the the mood of the room or, or, or where you're at, that kind of stuff? Yeah. 
Do you feel that you, when you're when you're out with that limited selection of stuff, what you've brought in your bag, are you able to to sort of tailor it to uh, successfully to each situation that you're in, or um, are you are you uh, do you encounter situations where it's just not it's not flying with the with the the people in the room? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. Um I do get that, but I like to try to convince people a little bit too, you know, to just hear me out. And um, but yeah, generally I bring a, a a a variety of things. I like a lot of different kinds of dance music. Um, so, what kind of stuff, uh, other artists, are you uh, feeling right now that are that are out there, people might know or want to check out? Oh, all kinds of music, like in any any sure. style or yeah, definitely. Oh. Um, Geez, what have I been listening to lately? Uh, okay. <laughs> Put you on the spot. You know, I mean, oh, crap. Oh, man. What, what was, I, was I listening? See, the thing is, I work at a used record store in Ann Arbor, so I'll buy a record and, and it'll be whatever, and that, that, that's what I'll be into um, at the time. I, I got into. Um, <laughs> I, lately, I've been just way into disco, you know, like. Hardcore like um, Ed Edward Bird song and um, um, of course like a lot of the things that Ron Hardy was spinning and um, uh, Boogie um, D Train um, man I'm sorry I'm I'm yeah. blank I'm blanking out here that was uh, um, yeah I don't know I like stuff. a lot of different kinds of stuff anyway uh -huh. you know so it's it's not it's not like you're you're strictly listening to um, the particular music that that you make. I mean, the, no, the, no. The I mean, yeah, no. I, like the last CD I bought was uh, Armenian Duduk and Zorna music. I mean, I just, I just, I mean, it just depends, you know. Do you uh, do you have plans to collaborate uh, with more? I mean, are there people who you want to work with, uh, a la the the JD stuff or, or other collaborators? I yeah, know you work yeah. with, uh, you've been doing stuff with Todd. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but I don't want to work with him anymore. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I want to work more with uh, Guilty Simpson. And, and uh, you know, we, we did a, a, a special, and that was really, really fun. And I've always been a big fan of Guilty Simpson. He's got a very powerful voice. and, and uh, um, From Detroit, delivery. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, um, Jeez. Uh, yeah, a lot of the guys in Detroit are really talented. Fat Cat and I are talking about working together. Um, we, we did a little something extra for BBC. Um, so, uh, and we also, uh, uh, Black Milk and I uh, collaborated. Um, and uh, we're talking about collaborating some more and Tarak and Wajid and, and uh, you know, I'm really happy with the people that I collaborated uh, with um, on 2-3. The MCs were ridiculous, and I'll work with any of them again. They're all super good. What's What's the process aside from working with MCs, where it's pretty cut and dried? You make the beats, they rhyme. What's the process like when you're working with another beat maker, actually, or or a producer? How do you How do you collaborate in that situation? Well, it's funny because every time I say I want to collaborate with someone they say exactly what I'm thinking about the collaboration. You know, I, I know what you're saying. There's a lot of different ways you could do that, like get in the studio and stuff. But usually we're like, here's a few orphans I, or incomplete tracks I have, like, um, you know, some things I've been working on or here's some basic sounds and, and, and the beat that I had in mind that it's really basic. And, and uh, they'd give it to me and, and I'd, uh, I'd flip it or vice versa. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it can be... It can be difficult when you want to work with somebody and either they're not familiar with the gear that you're using or, you know, how, how do you... So you're not starting from scratch usually. It's, it's something that you've kind of got a kernel of and yeah. then they come in and add on to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's, uh, what's in the pipe right now? What projects are, are uh, forthcoming? Well, I've got an album coming out on Spectral under the name JTC, James T. Cotton, um, uh, called Like No One, and it's a, um, I don't know, yeah, so uh, I, I've got that. It's a lot of acid and techno and house. Um, 
and uh, there's a remix EP, Dabry remix EP coming out soon, featuring um, uh, Flying Lotus remix, Black Milk remix, uh, Code Nine remix, and um, and an exclusive track that I did with AG called Get Dirty. Um, and that's what's in the pipeline right now. How how is that working with a New York guy? Uh, are you talking about AG? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As showing AG, mm -hmm. yeah. W was that was that any different for you? I mean, it's, you've been pretty Detroit uh, yeah, yeah. centric. Yeah, it's no different. I mean, this guy has a you know this guy probably has a um, a bigger reputation than some of the Detroit people I worked with because of his history and the respect that New York rap gets. And uh, but no, not not different at all. It's real easy and fun. Cool. Well, um, I want to give uh, a everybody in here a chance to, you know, say something or ask any questions that uh, they might have. So, uh, if uh, if anyone has anything that uh, they want to talk to Tad about uh, in the public forum, uh, let it be known. Um, are we going to be uh, able to see you uh, DJ again here in Toronto or are you off back to Detroit? Uh, yeah, I'm leaving tonight. I'm leaving this afternoon. Uh, well, you guys missed it the other night if you didn't see it uh, <laughs> at the hotel. Like six <laughs> people there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. It, it was good. Yeah, that's true. That's good. Well, that's good. Thanks. Definitely. Uh, all right. Uh, hi, anybody? Um, oh. Do you have a process when you're setting up all your different aliases, or is it just like, okay, I'm feeling EBM right now, let's do a track and then come up with the name later? Uh, yeah, the latter. But basically, um, I just do whatever I feel in the studio, whatever I'm in the mood for, and uh, automatically I already have an alias for whatever it's going to be. So, um, uh, you know, the what kind of music and, and what to call something, even track names and album names, all those things really come later in my, in my mind. I'm not very concerned. In fact, I really don't even like to, to think up things like song names and, and alias names and stuff like that. Um, that doesn't seem to be a common factor in your dance music. Um, where do you, do you get your inspiration from? Do you lock yourself up with mushrooms in your room or? <laughs> No, I'll try that though. Um, uh, yeah, there's there isn't really really a, a common factor at all. I'm just um, spacing out. I get really really uh, inspired by by something, and uh, you know sometimes I need to like get into the right mood for a certain genre. You know, if if I've got a deadline deadline coming up, you know, so if I uh, you know, if I need to make a Dabry album or something like that, I'll, I'll throw on some, you know, um, something a little more close to, to hip hop. You know, I try not to play too much hip hop because I don't want to start like subconsciously picking up someone's style and, and getting too influenced by them. But if I have to work, get into the, the uh, Dabry mode, I'll think about um, playing some Afrobeat or, or, or uh, um, Ethiopian funk like Mah Mahmoud Ahmed and, and uh, um, yeah, or, or I don't know, like, um, but if, you know, for example, and if I'm trying to get into uh, the mode for a JTC track, I have to do, I'll, I'll play some old disco or some Patrick Adams or, um, okay, now I'm just name dropping, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> And yeah, so I just I try not to play the people that that are directly too close to what I do because I really have to focus, uh, especially in this day and age where a lot of people are making music and a lot of people are releasing on labels and stuff. There's a lot of young, inspired talent out there that um, I'm trying not to. Uh, I'm trying to dis consciously distinguish myself from other people that might be doing something similar to what I'm doing. Um, right after uh, One Three came out. There were some artists that started doing things that sounded really similar, and I'm not trying to say that they were influenced by me or, or, or anything like that, but um, I, I had to be concerned with uh, making sure that I'm challenging myself and, and maybe even them if they are getting influenced by what I do, you know, and, and, and try not to be too predictable. So I hope I answered your question. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. 
Um, when I first became aware of the Dabri stuff through the mini album, Instrumental, which I really love and I still play it all the time to this day. But I was going to ask, um, sort of that and 1-3 is exclusively instrumentals and 2-3 is very heavy on MCing. Was that um, a premeditated thing where you felt like you had to establish a sound before you let people on the mic or was it that you didn't yet have the sort of rep or the, the cachet to get people? On the latter, place? yeah, the latter basically. I mean, although, like I said, I was really way into DJ PNS's uh, fresh produce instrumental mixtape. Um, I had a very, very special um, interest in um, uh, instrumental hip hop, way more so than even like trip hop or down tempo or um, you know Moac stuff and, and and whatever, because I was just a lot more interested in the rugged, stripped down sound of in instrumental hip hop. Um, um, but uh, let's see. But what was happening was, um, at that time, I didn't know any MCs, basically. And, and uh, I knew some, and I didn't want to work with them. Um, and I thought, well, what's the best thing to do in this situation? Well, I might as well just like put out a few instrumental albums and let it be out there in the world and have that be my resume for any MC that wants to work. You know what I mean? And, and anyway, uh, when I'm asking for an MC to work, I can be like, OK, I already have a few releases. and, and uh, um, and and it, luckily, in many cases, um, the MCs were already hip to what I was doing, so it made things a lot easier. Um, also, in two three, there is. I mean, obviously, you've got your own interdisciplinary aliases and so on, but um, there seemed to be a change even in, in the, amongst the Dabri stuff between two three and the earlier stuff. As to my ears, anyway, a lot less reliant on samples. Uh, and you mentioned like sample clearance. Like, how do you feel about um, the, the sort of increasing problems to get samples cleared? And as your profile rises, do you think it's inhibiting, or does it? In, do you find it inspiring to move in different directions? Yeah, when you start selling a lot more records, you do have to be a little worried about how much you're flipping a sample. You know. Um, so yeah, uh, although I haven't been using more samples in my new music than I have in my previous albums. It's just maybe sounds a little more sample oriented or, or a little, maybe a little more layered in, in its sampling. But um, yeah, you know, I, d I do get a little concerned about that. But um, you know, what I basically try to do is, is sample things even more obscure, things way under the radar. Um, I've sampled some, some um, music that, that is, uh, was obviously from like a local group and, and we'll never see the light of day, hopefully. And uh, you know, I even like to sample real bad music so no one would even think to, you know, go, go in there and you know, I might find like two seconds of something really nice in, in a generally terrible um, Muzak album or something like that, you know. So there are a few different things that you can do to avoid uh, worrying about clearing. In regards to um, all the side projects, well, not side projects, but all the separate projects that you have, um, how do you kind of differentiate like what you're going in to work on? And, and I assume that you get to a point where you start something that isn't necessarily what you intended it to be and kind of maybe ca cater more towards one of the other projects that you work on. So like what, what, what's your like your meter for, okay, this is definitely not what I, what I intended, so now it's something else. And, and like, do you maybe use your instruments to set to sort of you know set a line or a barrier? Like, well, I'm not going to use this. You know, I'm not going to use a 101 on any of you know this project because it sounds a certain way. Or you know, like, how do you limit yourself? Uh, you know, I think I, my studio is really limited anyway, so it's like easy to 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 limit myself. Um, you know, uh, no, I, I don't let the instruments, well, see, there's crossover, you know, I can use the 101 on, like, maybe, like, a funky, warm, sort of sounding lead in a dabby track, but I would normally use maybe a 101 as, like, a synth line or a bass line in, in, a, in a JTC track. Um, so, um, really, uh, um, genrefying happens sort of automatically with me. I don't, I generally don't make like hip house or anything that could be anywhere in between Dabri and, and, and JTC, you know, so um, uh, I, I really like to keep the sounds very, very separated automatically and um, um, 
so, so it's easy for things to just kind of fall in line uh, naturally. All right. All right, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. <laughs> okay. Uh, which one do we have on here? Is it? This should be called a police. Yeah. Definitely, definitely something for, for y'all to like tuck away in the back of your mind is that uh, that that track that was sampled and, and sort of emulated on the, the bass line there was uh, uh, originated by King Jammy, who's uh, going to be here later. That was like a little slang tang uh, takeoff there. So, yeah, man, that was some hot, hot <laughs> business right there. Um, I'd like to thank Tad for coming down and uh, Thank you to us. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much. A pleasure.